Can a protest leader be held responsible for the actions of a rogue protester? I'm Teray McKesson. I'm a civil rights activist. A lawsuit against McKesson is grappling with that question. In 2016, McKesson was in Baton Rouge protesting the police killing of Alton Sterling. During the protests, someone threw a heavy object at a police officer, severely injuring him. No one knows who threw the brick. McKesson didn't throw the brick, he didn't tell anyone else to throw the brick, and he wasn't even there when the brick was thrown. But the officer is suing McKesson anyway as the alleged leader of the protest. I had no clue an officer got hurt before the lawsuit was filed. Lawsuits like this one are usually dismissed. McKesson was sued by cops four other times in 2016 for things other protesters did. It was like, okay, I'm being sued by this person, I'm being sued by this person, I'm being sued, and there were five lawsuits in total. Uh, we got all the cases dismissed, including this case was dismissed, so I felt very good about that, and then the dismissal got overturned by the Fifth Circuit. In April, three judges on the Fifth Circuit said the Baton Rouge lawsuit could proceed. It was a surprising decision because it seems to ignore a pretty clear Supreme Court precedent. In the 1960s in Mississippi, the NAACP organized a peaceful boycott of white-owned stores. But some of the protesters got a little carried away. I sure I believe in nonviolence. But what has it gotten us? Now, this old drugstore uptown, old Pete's drugstore, is off limits. So stay out of there. Yeah. If anybody go in there, break his back. Boycott enforcers fired shots at two black people who broke the boycott, and a brick was thrown into the windshield of another. So the white merchants sued the NAACP. It could have destroyed the movement because they were asking the NAACP for millions of dollars in damages. Mary Frances Berry is a lawyer and historian who once ran the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. The NAACP won the case in the Supreme Court. And the court said that the only way you could make a claim like that stick is if there were a direct connection between the harm that you're complaining about and the actions of a specific actor that you can reach a conclusion that there ought to be a remedy. The Supreme Court unanimously decided that because the NAACP didn't directly order the violence, the boycott was still protected by the First Amendment. This case is so crucial and so important because if you're in a movement, anybody who's ever been in one knows, you cannot account for every single person in the protest and say that somebody might not say something out of bounds or somebody may throw a brick or do something. There was a difference between the NAACP's protest and the one McKesson participated in in Baton Rouge. Boycotts are legal. Marching onto a highway is not. There isn't a very big sidewalk on this side. It's a couple, it's like three, four, five hundred people. McKesson allegedly led a group of protesters onto a highway and blocked traffic. He was quickly arrested, along with many others. Look at the city police, you're under arrest. What? Don't fight me, don't fight me. Don't fight me. Don't fight me. I'm under arrest, y'all. I know that part of civil disobedience is a disobedient part. And I knew that when I walked into the highway. I knew that we were in the street uh, to make it really clear that Alton should be alive today and that the only way to get the attention of people was to do things that disrupted their sense of normalcy. But could that one action McKesson took make him liable for illegal actions others took later? Three judges on the Fifth Circuit think so, and that's why they allowed the case against McKesson to proceed. Here's Ben Wisner, a lawyer from the ACLU, to explain their reasoning. Essentially what they're saying is that once DeRay urged protesters to walk out into the street and block traffic, it was foreseeable that the police would respond, and it was foreseeable once the police responded that there might be an altercation with protesters, and it was foreseeable once that happened that an officer might be injured. Uh, and because of that chain of foreseeability, DeRay can be held personally responsible for a rock that was thrown by someone else without his agreement or approval whatsoever. The problem with this ruling from the court in Louisiana uh, is that it would basically hold any civil rights leader or protester liable for any of the actions of anyone else. Gandhi broke the law, Martin Luther King broke the law, but does that mean that the person who leads that march uh, would be responsible if someone pulled out a gun and started shooting? And the answer is absolutely not. 
McKesson filed a petition last month to have his case reheard by the entire Fifth Circuit, hoping they will overturn the decision of three of its judges. If he's denied rehearing or if the Fifth Circuit disagrees with him, he'll appeal to the Supreme Court. Ultimately, if the case is tried in court, McKesson is confident he'll win because he says he didn't organize the protest or order people onto the highway. What really worries him is something else. I'm more worried about the precedent set by allowing this case to move forward, that chilling effect it could have on anybody in any leadership role, in any social justice movement, that they could be held civilly negligent for the actions that just ensued in the middle of a protest are just, uh, the ramifications for that are wild. It would be a big win for all of us if we can uh, make sure that the rationale offered by the Fifth Circuit is not something that has taken as precedent across the country.